Welcome everyone to this second summer edition of Community Conversations. I'm David Coates, the Interim Provost. As always, I'm joined by Justin Anderson, our Vice President for Communications, from the Star Instructional Studio in Barrie Library, where we are recording today's conversation on August 17th. Justin and I will be joined today by Kellen Appleton, the Director of First Year Trips, Rick Mills, the Executive Vice President for Finance and Administration, and Lisa Adams, Associate Dean for Global Health, Director of the Center for Global Health Equity, and Professor of Medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine. Before I introduce our guests, let me begin with a campus update. First, regarding COVID-19. At the last Community Conversations on July 21st, my guests and I shared this table, unmasked here in the studio, and we're pleased to report virtually zero new cases had been discovered at Dartmouth in the month prior. And we're especially excited by the increasingly normal feel of life on campus. Well, a lot can happen in a month. As you know, the Delta variant has been sweeping across the country and it is likely the cause of a spike in positive cases we discovered on campus at the beginning of August. Indeed, I need to inform you that on Tuesday, August 17th, Dartmouth identified a cluster of three linked COVID-19 cases in the student population. All of these students live off campus and all are now isolating at home. The state of New Hampshire defines a cluster as three or more individuals confirmed with COVID-19 who are part of a related group of individuals who had the potential to transmit infection to each other through close contact. These three clustered cases are part of 21 positive cases on campus discovered between August 1st and August 17th, 11 students and 10 employees. At least 19 of these 21 cases were in fully vaccinated individuals. Some had no symptoms, some had mild system, symptoms, all have isolated themselves and are recovering well. This news brings to mind several things. First, it is comforting to hear that all of these employees and students are doing well. The vaccines are doing what they are supposed to do. They reduce your chance of becoming infected, and even if you are infected, the vaccines drastically reduce the chance of contracting a serious illness that requires hospitalization. Second, it is a reminder that vaccination does not necessarily prevent infection. And according to the emerging scientific evidence, it is possible for a fully vaccinated person to become infected and then pass the virus on to other people, including people who are unable to be vaccinated and who are thus particularly vulnerable. As a result, Dartmouth and the town of Hanover recently renewed policies that require everyone to wear masks indoors, regardless of vaccination status, to reduce the prospects for the virus to spread more widely on campus and through the community. We have since received many messages about this return to indoor masking from students, parents, faculty, and staff. Many are upset about the decision, seeing it as inconvenient and as a step backward in our return to normalcy. Many are grateful for the decision, feeling it better protects them and their families. They're both right. It is inconvenient. It is a step backward. It is also the best, most effective way to reduce the spread of the virus through our community where it might reach the most vulnerable, including children under 12 and others who are unable to be vaccinated. As a reminder, our current policy requires indoor masking in most situations. Specifically, if you're unvaccinated, you may only remove your mask when in a private office or bedroom or when actively eating or drinking. If you're vaccinated and you have any COVID-like symptoms, it's the same thing. You may only remove your mask when in a private office or bedroom or when actively eating or drinking. If you're vaccinated and you have no symptoms, then you may also remove your mask when working alone in a shared office or lab or studio. We know that's still a lot to ask. After carefully considering the current situation on campus, in town, in our region, along with the latest science, we feel comfortable now relaxing the policy in two ways. First, residents of on-campus housing, including Greek houses, may remove their masks anywhere in the residence if they are vaccinated and have no symptoms. Second, two people who are vaccinated and have no symptoms may remove their masks for a one-on-one -on -one indoor meeting if both are comfortable doing so. In all other indoor settings, please wear your mask. 
It is especially important to wear your mask when in close proximity to others, such as in classrooms, or when you're in large, busy spaces like the library. Let's flatten the curve, please. For details of the policy, see the face covering policy at covid.dartmouth.edu, easily found at covid.dartmouth.edu. By the way, actively eating does not include those long hours studying at the library, slowly nursing a cold drink or nibbling, nibbling occasionally on a candy bar. Please mask up and remove your mask only briefly when drinking or eating. To me, it, it all boils down to respect. Respect for your fellow human beings, for the students and staff who work around you, and for those who are unable to be vaccinated or may be particularly susceptible to infection or its consequences. Again, we know this policy is inconvenient, uncomfortable, and very disappointing after a month of relative freedom. We feel the same way. Nonetheless, we'll be living with this virus for years to come, and we will continue to adapt as we better understand the risks, how to best balance the risks to the physical and mental health of everyone in our community, everyone, students, faculty, staff, and families. At this point, you may be wondering, with the COVID task force disbanded, who is we? Who is monitoring the situation and how are we making COVID-related decisions? Executive Vice President Rick Mills and I are leading Dartmouth's COVID operations. We'll meet Rick in a few minutes. We work with four teams to help us monitor the camp situation on campus, in our town, in our county, and in our local hospitals, along with the latest science about the potential for the Delta variant to spread to and through vaccinated individuals. We meet twice weekly with the COVID leadership group to discuss new information and finalize any adjustments to policy. In parallel, the core group, a subset of the old task force, continues to meet weekly to manage day-to-day -day logistics and implementation. And the work of the testing group, which has coordinated on-site testing operations, is slowly being integrated into Dartmouth's existing Office of Environmental Health and Safety. Finally, this week, Rick and I launched a new science advisory group composed of clinical and research faculty from Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine and the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, including experts in epidemiology, pediatrics, and student mental health. This new group expands our ability to track the evolving scientific understanding of the virus and public health measures. On some points, the science is absolutely clear. The vaccines approved by the FDA and the WHO are extremely safe and effective. Second, the risk of a fully vaccinated person becoming infected when exposed to the coronavirus is low, far lower than if they were unvaccinated. Third, once infected, the risk of a fully vaccinated person experiencing systems, symptoms is low, and the risk of serious symptoms requiring hospitalization is very low. On other points, the science is less clear and is evolving daily. It seems possible for a fully vaccinated person to become infected and then become infectious, that is, capable of spreading the virus to others. Although this occurrence seems unlikely and short-lived when it happens, we're not yet sure how often this might occur. And we can talk more to Lisa Adams about these questions in a few minutes. We remain optimistic <clears throat> that with your support and cooperation in wearing masks now, we can prevent a wider outbreak that may require further constraints down the road. I want to emphasize that the return of indoor masking is not intended as the first step down the path to other more restrictive measures like social distancing, smaller event sizes, or remote learning. Indeed, indoor masking is one of the most effective ways to prevent the spread of the virus and avoid any need for those further measures. Well, of course, we can't forecast the future and we will adapt as needed to emerging conditions. We can all do our part now to maximize the chances for a normal fall term. Again, we truly appreciate your patience and understanding and we'll update you as soon as we learn more. Now, let me take an opportunity to answer some of the most common questions that I've been receiving through email. First, why did we reimpose indoor masking for everyone so quickly? It seemed to come by surprise to many people. Well, we were surprised by the sudden spike of new cases at the very beginning of August. Also around the same time, the CDC indicated our county was experiencing substantial transmission rates and recommended indoor masking. 
the town of Hanover re-implemented its indoor masking policy. So it was prudent for us to do the same. Second, I often hear the on-campus community is 94% fully vaccinated, which is great. So why do we need to mask up? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the latest scientific evidence that even fully vaccinated people can be infected by the coronavirus. In fact, all but two of the positive cases discovered on campus this month were in fully vaccinated individuals. Neither of these things are really surprising. The vaccines are doing what they're supposed to do, keep people from becoming so ill they need hospitalization. And for, in that regard, they're succeeding. Next question was, how can students be involved in the process of deliberating new restrictions? Well, I've personally met several times with the leadership of the Student Assembly and am planning to assemble an advisory group of student leaders from across the institution, undergraduates and graduates, to help advise us on these questions. Another common question is, although most of our peer schools have similar indoor masking policies, isn't Dartmouth somehow different? We are in a rural area and we have very high on-campus vaccination rates. Yes, that's true. We always consider Dartmouth's unique characteristics when making our choices, as does every other campus. It is true that most other campuses have made the same choice for now. We will keep making our choices based on our conditions. How long will the mask mandate be in place? And should students prepare for another year of lockdown or online classes? Well, no, I don't think so. We continue to monitor the latest science, current guidance and local conditions, and will relax the mask mandate, mask mandate as soon as it is reasonably safe to do so, hopefully by the end of September, if not sooner. We do not anticipate a need to return to lockdown or online classes. In fact, let's avoid that possibility by masking up now. And finally, my favorite question, I just want the pandemic to be over. I'm tired of masking and all the rest. Can't we just have a normal fall term? Yeah, well, me too, right? We're all tired of this pandemic. We all want a normal fall term. Indeed, that again is why it's so important to do indoor masking right now to keep the virus from spreading and ruining our fall term. All that being said, vaccination still remains their best line of defense against COVID-19. At the beginning of this week, 94% of our campus community is fully vaccinated, as I mentioned. We expect this number to continue to rise, and we expect all students, faculty, and staff to be fully vaccinated before they return to campus or receive an approved exemption for medical or religious reasons. For those of you not yet vaccinated, I urge you to do so as soon as possible. To find a local vaccination center, visit www.vaccines.gov. For more information about Dartmouth's COVID-19 policies and practices, you can look at covid.dartmouth.edu. Well, we've come a long way in the last 16 months, and there are likely further challenges ahead of us as new, more contagious, uh, contagious variants might emerge. But this campus has proven time and again to be resilient. Our current situation may not be what many of you envision for this fall, but again, with your continued patience and cooperation, we can weather this storm as we continue to move towards a path to normalcy. Next, regarding on-campus student housing. As many of you know, we are facing unprecedented demand for on-campus housing this fall, literally at the levels we have never, ever seen in Dartmouth history. We've been working diligently to place students into campus housing as space becomes available and the wait list is shrinking quickly come a long way from the last community conversation. Still, our work is not yet done, as long as there are still graduate and undergraduate students seeking housing for the fall term. I know the Graduate Student Council has been working to support incoming graduate students who are still seeking off-campus housing. And the Undergraduate Housing Office has been working hard to reduce the gap between the number of on-campus beds requested and the number available. You may also have seen my announcement about the new interim dean of the college. We've just appointed Scott Brown as interim dean of the college and Marianne Huger Thompson as interim associate dean of student affairs. Scott spent three years working in student affairs at Dartmouth in the early 1990s and most recently served as interim associate vice president and dean of students at Northern Arizona University. He began work at Dartmouth this week remotely and will be on campus by the end of the month. 
Marianne comes to Dartmouth from Syracuse University, where she has served for the past three years as Associate Vice President for Student Experience and as Dean of Students. She will be on board next week and on campus by the end of this month. I know both of them look forward to meeting with students soon. I hope to introduce them to all of you in a future episode of Community Conversations. Once again, I want to pass along my deepest thanks to Catherine Lively, who stepped down as Dean of the College at the end of June, for overseeing the work of the Division of Student Affairs as Dean of the College for the past three years. During her tenure, Catherine worked tirelessly on such issues as food insecurity on campus, expanding support for first-gen low-income students, increasing Dartmouth's mental health services, and of course, guiding student affairs through the COVID-19 pandemic. So this brings me to the fall. It's hard to believe, but September is just around the corner. As students return to campus this fall, we are eager to celebrate their homecoming and to rebuild the sense of community that is so essential to the Dartmouth experience. A survey was distributed last month to all returning students asking for their ideas and input on rebuilding community efforts. We hope the survey will guide the student life team to generate programming ideas and to inform student governance organizations as they represent student interests. As we approach September, I'm especially excited for the arrival of the class of 2025. Although some student athletes and those participating in FICEP's summer session are already on campus, the majority of the class will be joining us on Friday, September 3rd, as they move into residential halls. A day or two later, they will depart for first year trips. We'll talk about those trips in a few minutes when we meet the trips director, Kellen Appleton. Although Kellen is focused right now on preparing for the class of 2025, she will also give us a sense of what's being planned for the class of 2024, who of course were unable to participate in a traditional TRIPS program last year. So now let me turn to Justin and see if we have any questions from the audience. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, nice to see you again today. Um, we're going to take just um, just two questions, and then we're going to we're going to uh, transition over to uh, Rick and Lisa and bring them into the conversation. Um, the first question uh, pertains to the fall, which you discussed briefly at the end of your remarks. Uh, the question is, it's a two-part question, given the COVID trends since our last community conversations, how have Dartmouth's plans changed for the fall? Will the COVID task force be reinstated? You obviously addressed that second part, but I think it, it's worth sort of emphasizing uh, why the decision was made and why the current plan is in place and how that will work going forward. Yeah, so our plans for the fall remain uh, in, in effectively the same. We plan to teach you know, all the courses in person, uh, to have fully densified dormitories and dining and student activities and athletics and so forth. Um, we have put into place this new governance structure, as, as you mentioned, uh, that will help us to monitor and manage any emerging situations. Um, and we've also set up a teaching transition coordination group, a group of faculty and key staff from across campus to plan for right now and also monitor and manage as um, the, the um, in-person teaching um, combines with the challenges of COVID, whatever they may come to be. Dave, I'll ask one more question, which you can answer, and then I'll let you um, uh, introduce Rick and... Um, Lisa, uh, this question um, uh, is about also about the fall. Um, are there going to be remote classes in the fall, uh, particularly for people who can't travel to campus or for those who may not have fall housing? Right, at this point, we are not planning to have any classes operate remotely. Um, the, uh, it is unfortunate if there are some people who are not able to be in Hanover, but the vast, vast majority of students we expect to be in Hanover, and we plan to operate in person much as we always have. Okay, thanks Justin, uh, it's great, uh, good questions. And now let me introduce uh, Rick Mills, the Executive Vice President for Finance and Administration, who has been a frequent guest on this program, and Lisa Adams, the Associate Dean for Global Health and Director of the Center for Global Health Equity, and a professor of medicine at Geisel, who's been an even more frequent guest on this program and an always very helpful advisor. Um, maybe I'll start with Lisa and um, get your take on why, 
we, why you think masking is so important right now, even for people who are fully uh, vaccinated. Yeah. Thanks, Dave, for that question. Um, great to be uh, on your community conversations. So we have learned that, as you said, masking has become a bit of a hot button issue. Um, but let me try to clarify why masking is important. And in doing so, I will, will reiterate and, and further expand upon some of the things that you've already uh, said. But first, let me state the obvious. We know masks work. I know everybody may know this, but I think it's helpful to restate it. We have over 40 peer reviewed articles that have confirmed that wearing masks and mask mandates are effective in decreasing transmission of COVID. And they do so by effectively blocking the release of respiratory droplets. And one of my favorite studies among these 40 plus is from researchers at the NIH and University of Pennsylvania that was published in the New England Journal in uh, just a couple months ago. And the researchers used high speed laser light technology that measured oral droplets expelled by someone speaking and showed that about 300 fluid droplets flashed or lit up when participants said the words, stay healthy without a mask on and that less than one fluid droplet flashed when um, participants said the same phrase while wearing a mask. And the, the video capturing this is actually pretty dramatic. So we also know that masks protect both the wearer and those they come in contact with. Now, some may say, why do we need to focus on reducing transmission of COVID among people who are fully vaccinated? And that brings me to my second point. And that is while our current vaccines are highly effective, we've always said and known that they're not 100% effective. And we know the Delta variant is particularly contagious. And as you said, we know that vaccinated individuals can contract and can transmit infection, although they are certainly less likely to do so. So not surprisingly, we are seeing breakthrough infections occur across the country, across the state of New Hampshire and in our own community where we have a highly vaccinated population. As you said, we now have over 90% of our faculty, staff, and students accessing campus being fully vaccinated. Out of the breakthrough cases we've had in our community, roughly 90% have had some symptoms. Now, I think protecting everyone from getting COVID when possible, even if symptoms are likely to be mild, is a good goal because there's always a risk that sometimes that won't be the case. And we also know that even mild symptoms can persist for weeks or months. But then I can hear the next question, which is, but if COVID is mostly a mild illness among vaccinated individuals that we won't soon eradicate globally, and it's more likely just an inconvenience to lose your sense of taste and smell for weeks or months, is masking really necessary? Which brings me to my last and I hope most compelling case for mask wearing, uh, which again is something you alluded to, which is that we have people in our community who are not able to get vaccinated themselves and or may have household members that can't get vaccinated either because they're too young or among those with medical contraindications to vaccination. And many of them are frightened, understandably, about what could happen if they contract COVID themselves and or pass it on to their at-risk um, household member. So while we have a very high vaccination rate in our Dartmouth community, only about 60 62% of the residents in Grafton County have been fully vaccinated and rates are certainly lower in other places where our community members are traveling to. So since we don't live in an impermeable bubble at Dartmouth, um, until we see vaccination rates increase nationally, I think masking is the best option we have for balancing our goal to keep everyone in our community safe and doing so by choosing a means that allows us to still interact with one another, to gather together, and to have in-person teaching and meetings. Thanks, Lisa. Justin? Um, Lisa, if I, could, if I could stay with you uh, on a question from, uh, from, from a viewer, um, which references what we're hearing a lot of um, in the news about how we need to just learn to live with COVID. Um, and so this person asks, what does that look like at Dartmouth? Are we living with COVID now um, in terms of how we're approaching it as something that's going to be here forever? Or, or will it look different a year or two years or three years from now? So basically, what does it actually mean to, to just live with this thing uh, for, for the foreseeable uh, future and maybe beyond? Another great question. I think we all recognize that we will be and will have to be living with COVID for the foreseeable future, uh, maybe, maybe forever. I think 
What we are experiencing right now, though, is a transition period of learning to live with COVID, right? We have vaccines, highly effective vaccines that are available in the US. And again, I know I sound like a broken record in my vaccine promotion messaging, but really so important to get as any, everyone who is eligible and able to get vaccinated should be doing so because that is the best option we have for you know, dealing with this pandemic and returning to any sense of, of normalcy. Now, we will, once we see higher vaccination rates in our country and, and frankly, then globally, that's when I think we can start thinking about uh, what it really means to be living with COVID much as we live with seasonal flu every year, right? And unfortunately we have hospital, hospitalizations and deaths from seasonal flu every year, but we have effective vaccines that again, we try to promote um, and, and you know, do our best to encourage uh, people to receive. But I think for right now, until we can get our vaccination rates higher, I think we're gonna be in this transitional period of figuring out what, what other mitigation uh, measures we can put together in that, you know, many people have seen sort of that Swiss cheese model of where you line up several slices of Swiss cheese, each one has a bit of a hole in it, but when you line them up together, that's where you have, um, can offer the most protection. And I think that's where we are still now transitioning from hopefully being able to remove some of those slices of Swiss cheese. Um, if I may, I'll turn to Rick now with a question. Um, given the return to indoor masking, Rick, and the, on, and the anticipation of fall, what are you hearing from staff and supervisors about the originally planned return to work in September? I think, thanks, Dave. Um, thanks for having me here. I, we're certainly hearing more questions from staff and supervisors about whether we're going to make a change to that plan. And I think that's something that you and I are under active discussion uh, in thinking about where we want to go with it. It's something I think we'll get more advice from our clinical and scientific advisory board. And I'd expect we'd have something to announce early next week. Um, we have seen other employers, national employers, make the decision to push back return to campus or return to office. Uh, and it's certainly, uh, I think, something that's likely to be coming for us. But more information and a, con a concrete update next week. Justin? Um, Rick, um, if I could tack on with a question, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about um, vaccinations and masking and you know how well they're working or not working. Should it be mandated or not mandated? One thing we don't talk as much about uh, is ventilation and how, how our, our spaces um, around campus um, are, are or are not well ventilated. Um, given, given the, the uh, positive effects that, that a, a good ventilation system can have in terms of uh, getting, getting uh, air uh, out and bringing new air in, how are you uh, as EVP thinking about this when it comes to uh, the maintenance of buildings, the upgrades of buildings, bringing new buildings online? Um, is it more of a factor now than it was two years ago? Yeah, I would say it's definitely more of a factor. And I think whether you're at Dartmouth College or Dartmouth Hitchcock, all of us on the facility side are thinking about how do we increase air changes? How do we, how do we think about building buildings both today but, and operating them today, but planning them for the future in a way that lets us provide more ventilation? That's also balanced or coupled with this interest in reducing our carbon emissions and thinking about how do we do increased ventilation while at the same time not growing our carbon footprint. And when you're in Hanover in the winter, you're dumping a lot of BTUs out unless you've designed a pretty sophisticated system. So I think the answer to your question is in the near term, we are probably increasing some BTU usage by increasing air changes. Over the longer term, we're looking at building resilient systems that allow us to recover the heat before we do an air change, but maintain those that level of air changes. So there are things like enthalpy wheels, there are other devices that would allow us to recover heat and BTUs before we discharge the air and bring in fresh air for air changes. And all of our plans going forward are thinking about how to build those sorts of systems in. 
I have a, a question for Rick also that's kind of forward looking in, in terms of facilities. Uh, and again, not COVID, maybe for a moment we can step aside on student housing. I know your team has been working diligently on making plans, uh, medium and longer term plans for student housing. What updates can you share with us today? Sure, I think the, the biggest and potentially most exciting update is the work we've been doing out at Mount Support Road up by Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital to deliver new beds for graduate students, new graduate student apartments. We have been talking with the developer and I think we believe we're gonna be in a position to add more than 300 beds and bring them online as early as March of 2022, which is significantly in advance of what we'd originally targeted as sort of the August, September date. That will allow us to both utilize some beds for undergraduate housing as needed but also help alleviate the pressure the graduate students are feeling. And frankly, the entire community is feeling uh, in not having sufficient space to house all of the workforce, all of the students that we wanna be able to house. And we're not quite there yet, but that feels as though it's something that will come to pass. And we look forward to being able to confirm that we've actually achieved that over the slightly longer term we are actively engaged in discussions with trustees around the sequence of renovations for undergraduate housing, which everybody I think would say has been long overdue. The trustees at their last meeting approved the infrastructure renewal fund and a funding mechanism that will allow this to go forward. We're working on finalizing plans for swing space so that we can move students out of existing residence halls and begin that renovation process. And that's something that I would expect mid-October, sometime in the fall, we'll have more concrete information and begin to be able to track and show a schedule for that work. And over the longer term, it's intended that that work would add bed space and begin to move us out of being as constrained as we have been really since Dartmouth went co-ed, if you go back into the record. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's great. That's going to be a big help both for the quality and quantity of student housing. Thanks, Rick. Um, I, I think I'll turn back to Lisa now, and then also maybe Justin has some other uh, questions. Uh, Lisa, you, you mentioned um, in the previous answer this, this idea of when we might be kind of beginning to live with uh, COVID uh, on a routine basis. And I guess more immediately, what are the metrics you're watching or the science, scientific studies you're watching that will help us to determine when we can relax the mask policy again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are many different sources that we're following to really help inform our, our guidance, our recommendations to, to you and to Rick. Um, let me just outline a few. So first, there is the scientific literature, of course, and this includes the peer-reviewed publications really from around the world, um, as well as what we call the preprint articles. These are articles that have not yet undergone the full peer review process, but rather a, a sort of in-house screening by a preprint screening team that can be done rapidly, usually in about 24 hours for really quick turnaround um, compared to the many months of, of the usual peer review process. Um, and things are moving so fast with COVID data, everyone has had to consider the preprint data more than we ever have before. Um, so then secondly, I would say there is uh, the national state and local guidance that we track and try to see how best to apply that to our unique setting and circumstances. Um, as you know, and I think mentioned, our current masking mandate is compliant with Town of Hanover, New Hampshire State Health Department and CDC guidance. Um, so that's something else that we track. And then I would say, I guess, thirdly, you also mentioned too, that we look to see what our peers are doing, not as a directive, of course, but as a benchmarking process. And we participate in Ivy Plus and other university and college consortia um, where we can, we're really constantly sharing our current policies and rationale for adopting and adapting um, those policies. But some of the metrics that we're following now, um, it's really a set of metrics, a composite of several key factors and includes things like the vaccination rate among our students, faculty and staff and the vaccination rate in our local community and beyond. Our test positivity rate um, is another factor. And then our case rate and details about who is getting ill, are they breakthrough cases? What was the likely source? How severe is their illness? Um, sort of those, those uh, the epidemiology with the case rate piece, but also then some of the clinical information. And then 
Lastly, while this hasn't been a limiting factor in the past, of course, we do follow hospitalizations and bed utilization locally and across the state. And I certainly hope that will not become an issue for us, but it is something that, that we do also track. So really put together, there's really just a whole host of factors and, and um, that we have to consider. And it, it's really this composite set of, of um, variables um, and criteria that we, that we have to be tracking and, and um, assessing. We have time for one more question. Um, and Lisa, I'm going to give this question to you. Uh, and I'm going to do so with the caveat that I realize it may be too soon for you to respond. Uh, but as a former newsman, uh, I can't resist the temptation to ask you about something that is in the news, and it has to do with booster shots. Uh, there's news that the Biden administration uh, may begin uh, to recommend uh, booster shots for certain groups of people. And so my question to you is uh, just generally your view on booster shots and then more specifically uh, your view on, uh, on Dartmouth uh, administering them or uh, contracting someone to administrate the, administer them for, uh, for the community. Yeah. So great, great question, um, hot off the press, I, and I, I really appreciate that. So the, there's already been recommendations for booster shots for, for certain high-risk individuals, those with, with certain immunocompromising conditions and that meet certain criteria. That, that actually has also been adopted by the, the State Health Department in New Hampshire and, and you know, issued. Uh, so that is something that as clinicians, we are, we are beginning to follow. I, I will say, I. I have said, and I think even in this forum of a community conversation and, and elsewhere that I was fully anticipating booster shots to be part of our future. Um, you know, and, and I think you know, um, we've heard uh, from many experts that it wasn't a question of if, but when booster shots would be recommended. So this is, you know, not, not a great surprise to any of us. And, you know, I think if the data are there and the science are there, and I know it's it's being evaluated sort of for for uh, broader use before it's going to be announced um, from the administration, I, I do think we want to follow the science. We want to do what is medically indicated and from a public health point of view uh, indicated. So, I, I again, I, I was fully anticipating booster shots would become part of our lives, and I I will certainly um, promote them when they are uh, sort of uh, officially issued as, as a recommendation um, from our, our public health authorities. And again, you had asked earlier about what does it mean to be living with COVID? I think booster shots are part of what living with COVID is going to look like, just as we get um, annual flu shots, right? So I think, and, and, and we know our COVID vaccines are actually uh, much more effective than our, our usual flu vaccine. So what a great opportunity to, to really use, um, you know, the, the, the science, the, the uh, you know, the, the um, unprecedented, uh, you know, moment in, in vaccine history here to use the benefits of that and, and uh, to be able to really help turn around this pandemic. What I would like to see, of course, is, is uh, global equity, right? I'm the director of the Center for Global Health Equity and to see greater equity with access to vaccines. And I, I know that's coming, um, but yes, I think boosters are, are likely to be uh, in our future. And um, I think they make very good sense if they will help protect our, um, all of us who, uh, who uh, can get vaccinated. Lisa, thank you very much for that for that response and for your, all of your responses today. And Rick, thank you also uh, for joining us today. It was great to have both of you. Um, Dave, I'll go back to you uh, to introduce our final guest. Well, our next, next guest is Kellen Appleton, the director of First Year Trips. Kellen is a member of the class of 2020 and is focused on preparing for the arrival of the class of 2025. Welcome, Kellen. Hey, Dave. Pleasure to be on here. Great, it's good to have you. Kellen, I know the DOC First Year Trips program has a long history. Can you tell us a bit about its origins and why it is still such an important part of the arrival experience for the first year Dartmouth students to this day? Sure, um, so First Year Trips uh, was started as a program of the Dartmouth Adding Club back in 1935, which is almost 90 years ago at this point. Um, and it was started in response to this uh, expressed desire from graduating senior students uh, when they were reflecting on their time at Dartmouth um, 
finding that they wish they had spent more time uh, and earlier time engaging with the natural spaces and the outdoor uh, activities that you can find here. Um, so in response, uh, the Dartmouth Adding Club started running this first year trips program that uh, was an opportunity for incoming students to have these sorts of natural experiences in outdoor spaces uh, around Dartmouth right from the first day that they got to college. Um, at first, TRIPS was, it was primarily aimed at people who, who were interested in part, being part of the DOC. It was a little bit of a recruitment tool, but starting in the 70s and 80s, uh, you know, student organizers such as yourself, I mean, you were uh, TRIPS director back in what, 85? Yes. Um, uh, the kind of base of first year TRIPS started to uh, expand a little bit um, and expand rapidly actually as uh, TRIPS was aimed at all incoming students, regardless of what their, their interests were, their backgrounds were. Um, and this has expanded uh, continually until today, where we see about 90% of incoming students every year participating in a, a first year trip. So it's become this kind of ubiquitous experience um, for incoming students. And it's had a long history over the last several years of helping to foster the sorts of connections to people in place that, you know, people... Uh, want to have in, in the communities that they find at college. And I, I think that's a lot of the, the significance and the staying power of it. I, I mean, I think back on when I was on trips in 2016, and that's what I got a lot of, out of this. I, um, these sorts of connections and these sorts of personal space for personal reflection as, you know, I was coming from a very small high school and a low income space and being the only person from my state in my year. And this gave me space to look at the Dartmouth community, uh, find my place in it and adjust to it. And so, um, I, I, I think that's had a lot of the staying power. And beyond that, I think the, uh, uh, a lot of the power that comes from TRIPS is the sense of student involvement with it. It's very much a community, a community force. Um, you know, just this year, there's over 10% of the current undergraduate population is involved in TRIPS in some way. Um, there's, you know, over 300 leaders, uh, student leaders, as well as uh, over 100 support staff members, as well as you know, folks who are organizing and captaining these sorts of things. So it's a huge outpouring of student support. And I think really shows like uh, the Dartmouth community is ready to welcome these incoming students. And that's a really significant experience to have when you get here. Yeah, that's awesome. Justin? Uh, Kellen, I understand that trips will be structured a little bit differently this year, um, in part because of the pandemic. Um, how will it be different? Um, and uh, how will it be the same? Good question. Um, so I'm actually really, really pleased with what we've we've come up with for this year. Um, I'll preface this with saying from this perspective of an individual student or an individual trip, the experiences of trips that this year are not going to be that different from, from ordinary years. Um, starting on September 3rd, when uh, the majority of incoming students arrive on campus um, and integrated with the new student orientation calendar, trips are going to start running on the 4th and 5th of September going out in these waves sorted accordingly to with their housing communities. Um, and they'll spend three nights uh, with, their, with their trip together, coming together on the last night, uh, coming together the last night with several other trips and to share a large group meal and to, to share some evening programming before they come back to campus. Um, so we're still gonna see that familiar, that familiar and time-tested model of about eight incoming students paired with two upper level mentors who in the form of trip leaders who will lead on, or will go on um, some variety of trip. We have all sorts of trip types. I think we're up to 38 this year. Um, and I'm really excited actually, this is something that's new and different as well. We've expanded a bunch of the, the different types of trips. Uh, you know, a new one that I, I, I cooked up a little bit this year was a um, museum exploration, which is a partnership with the Montshire Museum to, to explore some of those spaces over there and have some of these connections community that way. Um, so those are the ways that that's the basic structure of it. And those are a lot of the ways that they'll stay the same. Um, one major change this year from, from last year, or, or not from last year, but from previous years uh, is uh, how we're interacting with the Mount Musalak Natural Area and the Mount Musalak mm -hmm. Ravine Lodge. Um, in the past, this sort of large group end of trips experience that I alluded to earlier has happened at the Moose Lock Ravine Lodge, um, but with a, a slightly different schedule this year and some shortening of um, our window, we're sending more trips out uh, at a time and more trips overall than ever before. Um, and what part of what that means is we've completely surpassed the capacity of, uh, of the Moose Lock Ravine Lodge to hold all those students at once. Um, and so, 
we're not going to have everyone go to the Moose Lock Ravine Lodge, but instead we'll have that sort of end of trips experience at a couple of different places around the Upper Valley. Um, beyond that, we're still, you know, committed to the Moose Lock Ravine Lodge area. It's it's one of our, our, our most treasured places. Um, I, I have a lot of personal significance there and we'll have some individual trips going there to have their trip programming and uh, we'll also be providing some uh, shuttles and special dinners for folks who want to go up there through the fall term. Um, so those are the, some of the ways that they've changed. But overall, I think I'm really pleased with how we've uh, adapted this year. And I think it's because of, uh, you know, the tireless efforts of all sorts of students that are working hard on this, as well as staff partners around campus. And I'm, I'm excited for it. Um, Kellen, um, unlike you and unlike Dave, um, I'm not a Dartmouth alum and I did not go on trips. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you could just say a little bit about about your your goals for trips um, generally, but then specifically for for this year, which is uh, an extraordinary year that follows what was already uh, an extraordinary year. Sure. Um, so I think I think our goals for this year and for trips in general are the same that they've always been, which is providing this sort of welcoming experience for incoming students to form connections to each other, to give access to upper level students that can serve as mentors and resources as they go through their time at Dartmouth, as well as opening up space for personal reflection and creating the sorts of sense of place in the, in the spaces around Dartmouth and in the uh, natural spaces that we find here. And those are our big overarching goals. Um, and I think that remains the same. I think those are ex extremely significant and um, go across all sorts of circumstances. That being said, like you're saying, this is an extraordinary year. People have gone through extraordinary experiences, um, positive, negative, different, uh, you know, va no value judgment on anything. But um, uh, yeah, so I think keeping that in mind, I think that coming to Dartmouth is going to be a big step in different ways for folks. And we're trying to be intentional about that, uh, providing space for, for these types of personal reflections, making sure that people are uh, challenged in the way that they want to be, um, you know, trips gets a lot of uh, a lot of value out of this like challenge by choice model of like putting people just a little bit into their discomfort zone to in order to uh, to grow and have these positive uh, experiences. And we're mindful that like even in a normal year as well, but even go this year especially, even going on trips can be something that's uncomfortable, even if they're you know go uh, doing an activity that they've already done in a space that they've already been like coming together with groups and new people and socializing in ways that you may not have before and we want to be really conscious of that and provide as many options and spaces for people to uh to to find what they need and to, to thrive as they as they enter the dartmouth community kellen this all sounds really fantastic i can't wait to see some of the trips go out uh, next month uh, i recall that you were also hired as director of first year trips last year for the class of 2024 which of course had to become a virtual program your whole team had to pivot what can you tell us about plans for the class of 24 this year? Yeah, so uh, you, you're right. I was, I was first year trips director as well. I was hired to do that. And we, we worked and pivoted to uh, starting in like April of 2020 towards creating the, what became the orientation peer leaders program, which uh, was, you know, the program that we had for the spaces that we were in. And I think provided a lot of community for people. And I'm really proud of that. But also, you know, keeping in mind that people in the, the class of 24 want and need the kind of experiences that people find on trips still. And that's that sense of community is something that a lot of students are still are still looking for. Um, I right now, my priority is, you know, ensuring that this goes off for the class of 25. And I want to be clear about that. But I think we're looking to the future and seeing um, the kinds of partnerships and programs programs we can uh, we can do with outdoor programs with new student orientation with uh, you know the whole division of student affairs um, for instance there's going to be during orientation some uh, specific programming for uh, for 24s getting them in on some of those experiences that they uh, they may not have had um, last fall like the, the traditional twilight ceremony and also looking at specific programming for 24s uh, throughout the year through orient uh, through outdoor programs creating these outdoor experiences for people that, that want them all this culminating uh, the next time that all of the the class of 2024 is back together on campus which is uh, the start of their sophomore summer we're we're very excited to uh, this is still in the preliminary preliminary stages, but we're very excited to continue to support and expand and uplift the the sophomore trips program, which is a 
several decade old program at this point that seeks to give some of the same sorts of experiences uh, that people find on first year trips, these sorts of community and place and reset and reflection and uh, these sorts of senses of place uh, that, we, that we see on trips to sophomores before they go into their um, uh, into their uh, the, their sophomore summer, and I, I anticipate that we're going to see a lot of demand for that this year. I think that's a, a, this upcoming year, and I think that's something that a lot of people are really looking forward to. Um, and I think I'm excited to continue to to be here and support those sorts of programs um, in the ways that uh, you know students want to see them. And I'm excited to get students involved with planning that as well. So lots of stuff coming up uh, coming up, and we're excited to keep supporting 24s as they find community here. Oh, that's great, Kellen. Thank you. And it's really neat to actually to have the opportunity to have the students involved in ideating and, and planning some of these events. Uh, very unusual. And um, really want to thank you again for all the hard work you're doing this year and last year uh, to make the transition to campus as effective and uh, welcoming as possible for both classes. So yeah, thank well, you for joining we're us. We're excited to, excited to pull it off. Cool. All right. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us today for Community Conversations. Thanks, Justin, for your help as always. Thanks, Kellen and Rick and Lisa for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you the next time. <laughs>